Um, well, you see it's the setup for a panel, and we're having a panel discussion now, the investor panel discussion, entitled Creating an International Ecosystem of Sustainable Chemistry Innovations, Promoting Sustainable Investments and Support Frameworks. And uh, I would like to hand over to our moderator for the panel discussion and like to introduce her. It's uh, Stefanie Andriolo. She is with uh, Concilion Business Consultancy, a uh, German-based uh, consultancy supporting sustainability transformation of actors in the financial sectors in, the, in areas uh, such as regulations, asset and portfolio management, credit processes, supply chain and ESG data management. Um, Stefania uh, studied philosophy, politics and economics and is a certified expert in sustainable finance by the uh, Frankfurt School of Finance. Um, yes, so welcome to you. And... Uh, I hand over to you. Thank you for being here. <laughs> all right. I hope you can all hear me well. Uh, I hope you also had a very nice lunch break. And uh, also from my side, welcome to today's panel. Um, as already mentioned by Alexis, the topic is uh, creating an international ecosystem for sustainable chemistry innovations, promoting sustainable investments, and supporting frameworks. Why have we chosen this topic? Well. Most frameworks for sustainable finance give specific goals in terms of value calculation, but leave it to financial institutions how this can be achieved. Today, we would like to hear from um, our illustrious guests how the financial road for innovation can be sustainably paved by taking into consideration several perspectives. So we are going to have the perspective of the fintech startups, the sustainable chemistry startups, wholesale and retail banks, as well as international sustainable and developmental banking corporations. I warmly welcome you, our audience. You are uh, consisting of startups, multipliers, and international investors alike, and I hope you are going to get a lot of insights from this talk. But mostly, it is my pleasure to welcome our guests in today's very international panel. So please welcome our guests. Here, I think it's that way. Perfect. Hello. Um, I might introduce to them, uh, to you, who are they, who they are, and what they are doing. So, Melvin Kizito is from Kenya. He's the founder of the company Alkyl Recycling. Jürgen von der Lea is from Germany. He's the lead strategy and sustainability at ENG. Agustin Figueroa is the climate and social smart projects advisor, working from Spain, but also worldwide. And uh, Marcelo Cabrol from IDB Labs is participating live and remote from Washington. Hi, Marcelo, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Good morning, good afternoon. It's great it's that great. you're here. All right, dear guests, thank you very much for being here. <coughs> Would you like to briefly introduce yourself uh, about your person, about your business, and your relationship to sustainable finance? Maybe we can start with you, Melvin. Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. My name is Melvin Kizito, as uh, probably I've introduced myself, this is the third time today. But we are developing a new process to recycle absorbent hygiene products like diapers. One thing about this type of waste stream is that it's a, it's a global problem. And especially in Kenya, we could see this problem of waste diapers firsthand. So we designed a new chemical process um, uh, to recycle uh, these waste diapers and to make a business out of it. So as a startup who's using sustainable chemistry to create a solution for the, for the world, uh, starting from Kenya, we went through certain stages in our development, and this really gave us insight on how financing in the transition to sustainability is a critical factor for the development of startups like ours. And I'm happy to be here, and I'm um, excited to share our journey. Thank you. Thank you. Jürgen? Yeah, thanks very much. Welcome, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm running actually strategy and sustainability for ING in Germany, and the reason why we combine actually strategy and sustainability is, is, is a very simple one. We totally believe that uh, 
sustainability is going to turn companies upside down and the same is also true for, for us as a bank. So it's also a very strategic decision that goes along with becoming more sustainable. And as a bank, we've divided actually our activities in, in basic, mainly three pillars. So the first one is actually, yes, we need to fulfill all reporting requirements, as you know from the chemical industry as well. We also need to re uh, comply to regulatory um, expectations. But there's a second layer, and that's maybe the most important one. We steer our credit or loan portfolio according to the 1.5 uh, um, uh, degree pass, um, or basically in alignment with the Paris Agreement. Um, so that's basically the main area in which we can have focus on. So you need to imagine that basically the emissions resulting from our loan portfolio is actually 2,000 times the emission of own, our own operation. I think that already shows a little bit the focus or the area we need to focus on. Apart from that, we have a third layer, which is rather in regards to inspire clients to behave more sustainable. But coming back to actually the role we have in the, let's say, in the sustainable transition, um, of course, we do financing for companies, but also for private individuals. In the company area, um, of course, we have several, uh, we have a broad range of industries. For the nine most important industries, from an emission perspective, we've defined individual actually pathways, scientific base. So we know actually for our loan portfolio where we are in terms of CO2 emission compared to the, to the pathway, and we know which way need to, we need to go and how we actually need to steer our portfolio in order to be aligned with the Paris Agreement. What kind of finance do we do? Of course, we do finance everything that's already green, but I think the more, more important piece of it is actually that we aim for financing the transition. That means we're willing and able to finance industries that are going to make their way towards net zero. We, for this, we have certain industries, uh, in, instruments in place. It can be sustainability-linked loans, basically linked to certain ESG-related KPIs a company needs to fulfill over time, Interest rates, um, if you will, incentives are linked basically to the, to the, to the individual progress. But we also do um, finance um, specific, specific purposes like everything around new energy transition, for example. So that's, that's also an area we focus on. And then we are also mandating uh, are mandated by many companies to support them actually in um, issuing their ESG bonds. Um, we also advise actually other banks in, in that area as well. So it, it has been a focus of the bank for almost six, seven, seven years now. And I have to also admit, we also finance industries which don't want to be in anymore. So that's rather the exit industry, you can imagine. So Germany has made the decision that nuclear and, and gas is, is not perceived as um, EU taxonomy compliant. So that's also an exit industry, for example, it's something we manage over time. Um, yeah, happy to explain more. Fabian. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me, first of all. Uh, my name is Fabian. I'm a co-founder of the fintech Grun, and uh, at Grun we aim to empower private investors mainly to unleash the full potential of sustainable and impact investments uh, by yeah, giving them mostly the, the non-financial insights everyone needs to uh, fully uh, understand the, the companies from a non-financial perspective. Um, yeah, and that's basically it, and I'm happy to share my insights with you and discuss the transformative power of sustainable finance. Thank you. Augustine? Hello, everyone. My name is Agustin. Uh, <clears throat> I studied agriculture engineering. However, I've been working for the financial sector for more than 30 years. And this is the challenge. And in the financial sector, I've been developing projects that should be, most of them were innovative, most of them were in emerging countries, and most of them were related to something else more than finance. Uh, my last seven years, have, I've been working in IFC as a climate finance advisor, and my unique selling proposition would be, uh, I want to make the sustainability profitable. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Marcelo? Once again, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Happy to be here. Um, Marcelo Cabro, uh, I'm the um, uh, Chief of uh, Scalability Knowledge and Impact at the IDB Lab. The IDB Lab is part of the IDB Group. The IDB Group is the largest uh, 
financial uh, development institution working in Latin America and the Caribbean. And uh, the IDB Lab specifically works with private sector innovation at the earliest stage. So we work with startups, entrepreneurs, and small and medium enterprises. Uh, our mandate is double. It's uh, to uh, redirect investment to the poor and vulnerable in Latin America and the Caribbean, but also to um, promote uh, climate and sustainability issues there. So I can tell you more in a moment. Looking forward to it. So as you heard, we have here a panel filled with fascinating stories. So let me ask you a couple of questions related specifically to your business. Uh, Melvin, I would like to start with you. Um, you moved from Kenya to the Netherlands with Alki Recycling. Um, so what is the difference in terms of innovation between these two countries? Uh, do you have a better infrastructure? Are there best examples, best cases that you can share from both systems? Yes, indeed. So one of the main reasons why we transitioned from Kenya to the, to the Netherlands is uh, the lack of infrastructure specifically to develop uh, startups in the chemical sector. So in our case, for example, we had this new chemical uh, process, new chemical reaction that we needed to, uh, that we, dis we discovered could solve the diaper, waste diaper problem. But when we needed to prove the technical uh, 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 results to, to do the actual chemical experiments, we did not have a proper lab or a proper piloting facility to run the experiments. So we were stuck with this brilliant idea, but without the uh, support in terms of the technical, technical aspect of it and also the financing, because it's, to build a, a, pilot in a, a pilot plant, for example, is very capital intensive. Our government does not have an infrastructure to support startups at this level, especially startups in the chemical sector trying to develop new chemical processes. <clears throat> so we had to build our own lab, which was, uh, this means we had to use very simple equipment. So you, we used uh, the little financing we have to uh, buy pipettes and you know, test tubes and so forth just to prove the concept. But this does not, did not give us enough uh, uh, results to actually prove the concept we were trying to build. But then the Netherlands has the infrastructure that we exactly needed. So we learned, learned about, for example, the Camelot campus, which is a, is a site that supports startups in the chemical uh, in sustainable chemistry. Here they provide uh, uh, laboratories which you can access and they're fully equipped. So you have really advanced analytical tools that startups can use at a subsidized cost and expertise, experts in chemistry and engineering who work with the startups and provide the necessary uh, uh, knowledge to build the technology. So it was, it was a big shift in experience from Kenya and, and in the Netherlands. Here we got exactly what we needed. We got the lab to run the experiments, we got the technical support, and also there's uh, real estate. So if you need to build a pilot plant, you actually have a space within the Camelot campus where you can build a pilot plant. This was really something we did not have access to back at home. So we see this is a, it's, it's, a, it's a really supportive ecosystem that is lacking and we need to develop that for, to encourage more chemical startups to, uh, to come out and, and, and bring the ideas to the world. Right. And looking at the international landscape, uh, Jürgen, how does ENG specifically engage into green investments on an international perspective? Um, yeah, I mean, we have our, we've defined our, our pathway for the industry. We've defined basically the industry we want to in be in and which we want to support. And we also designed actually a framework that is applied before actually a loan goes, for example, through the credit uh, committee. So that basically defines minimum criteria that needs to be fulfilled, but also some um, criteria that simply blocks an investment. But in general, internationally, um, I think we have uh, we've, uh, s built up a sector expertise that is uh, along the most important sectors, and that is actually run globally. So from that perspective, we anyway look at all engagements and all clients from a more global, international perspective. And um, along the way, we've also defined, uh, defined and designed actually a couple of innovative products. As mentioned in, in the intro already a little bit, we link actually sustainable progress um, with the, for example, with the interest rates, but also advise actually clients in... Um, the way how they in, in, in their 
transition making decisions. So we basically also help them to make a decision before changing their operations, for example, in the sense of what does it mean in terms of funding costs, what does it mean actually in terms of equity um, assessments by the, by the capital market, for example, but also the impact on share price in that sense. And um, indeed, we also advise them on the best instrument how to actually finance uh, transition or change. So it makes absolutely sense to have a broad portfolio in, in this regard. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's another very important point, of course, for us as a bank. It also means to diversify, basically, the, the income stream, but also the risk. And uh, from a risk perspective, um, there's a huge challenge for us actually incorporating or incorporating um, physical but also transitional risk, um, which can mm -hmm. come from policy changes, but also from environmental damages, and which has, is going to have a significant impact on our, our industry and also our uh, credit defaults. Um, I just recently saw a study by the ECB showing that basically that there's a, a huge difference in, in terms of default ratios of loan portfolios between reaching a 1.5 degree pass versus the 2.0 degree pass. So that's already a significant difference. That also means really we need to make conscious decisions on, on which business are we going to take on our book and which we are not going to take on our book. And Absolutely. Agustin, the <coughs> slogan in your vita is very powerful. Empowering banks and financial institutions to prosper through sustainable initiatives. What does this mean to you? Okay. Um, first, many, many thanks for being here. What I mean is, it's not only a purpose, however, a call to action. What I'm trying to explain is, as you can see, uh, most of us knows that we have to decarbonize our portfolio. We have to be net zero by before 2050. Everyone has to comply with the 17 sustainable development goals. There are, what I mean is, we know the what. For me, from my point of view, the key thing is how to work with the how. How we can implement that. And this is the challenge. And the challenge is how you keep the, the sustainability in the DNA of the company. It's not only a question of having few people or speaking about sustainability. It's a question of having that in your day-to-day -day business. The committees, what incentives do you have to put to your employees? What targets do you have to accomplish? Uh, what protocols do you have to use with your customers? There are many more things for, for having success uh, doing that. I can give you an example. If I had a customer database, I would divide that, that, that customer database into four quadrants. Those quadrants depends where you are, depending on how profitable you are, how sustainable you are. The idea is you have to have the most, as more customers as possible in the quadrant where, where they are profitable and sustainable. Not only one thing, because this is the way to have a, a good long-term relationship. And this is the way we can channel, it's, it's, it, it will make easy to channel the funds to the, to the right projects, okay? Yeah, speaking of the how, um, I would be very interested, in Fabian, in uh, Grun IO, technology could be one of the hows, how we can solve this problem. So can you maybe give a little bit of the insights on the technology behind your application? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so when we talk about our technology, you have to keep in mind that our perspective is we want to picture a company from a 360 degree angle. So not just, you know, mentioning the financial part, but also the non-financial part. And what we do is, first we kind of deploy big crawlers going all over the internet, catching every single information we can find about a company, ranging from social media posts, comments on that, uh, journalistic articles, sustainability reports, and so on and so forth. So everything basically you can find. When we have all that data together, or basically you can imagine like it's a, it's a big puzzle, and every corner is, is a single piece, 
and we try to bring that puzzle together to, to uh, have that full picture. And while the financial performance is one part of the puzzle, there's also this other part. And what we do is when we once, you know, get all the data together, we uh, try to structure the data with our self-developed uh, data pipeline, uh, getting it a little bit more sorted and um, ready for our uh, predictive AI model to uh, bring a little bit of you know, insightful knowledge into it. So basically validating the data we get from the internet. And we ha when, once we have done this, we try to make it ready to communicate to, other, uh, to our end customer via our product, Grun Analytics, where we say, okay, we give you everything that is needed for an uh, um, uh, end customer to realize, okay, what's sustainable in my perspective and what's not, probably, because sustainability as itself, it's not, it's not an objective that the uh, scientists can define by now, but it's rather a subjective uh, perspective. And that's also the approach we, we force because we say, okay, hey, you have to decide which way to go, and you need just the, the information to uh, yeah, basically uh, uh, get the information or... or um, have the decision for that. Absolutely. And um, here I have another good quote for you from uh, IDB Lab. They are saying their motto is promoting the use of technology, staying with your topic, with inclusion and innovative solutions. So Marcelo, can you please explain the work being done by IDB Lab in this context in Latin America? I can certainly do that. Um, look, uh, we, we believe that in equity and sustainability should go together. Uh, so it's very difficult for us to, uh, to separate one from the other. Uh, and it's very difficult to do equity and, and sustainability without technology nowadays. So we believe that technology needs to be there in order to provide the leapfrogging that we need. And at the base of technology is innovation. This is all obvious, but it's important to us in the sense that we understand that we need to provide our clients and our partners with uh, a way of uh, achieving very quickly technological adoption, understanding their social consequences of that, uh, embedding, the, embedding that in their business model, and actually taking that up to scale. Now, when we talk about sustainability and equality, we are talking about the partners that we work with. So when we talk about these topics, we start to think about what are the actors there that can be most useful, taking into consideration for this kind of development purposes. So at the IDB, we work quite a bit now trying to bring, for example, women and women founders and women in technology, especially on all the issues related to STEM. So that's the first thing that we are doing. We are working very much on bringing more uh, women into the fold of investment. The second thing that we are trying to do is we're trying to pervade our uh, industry partners, especially VCs. We work quite a bit with uh, venture capital. The venture capital industry needs to be more sustainable and needs to be sustainable from the beginning. So we're working with more than 57 VCs in Latin America and the Caribbean to have a pattern of sustainability and equality. And last but not least, we need to increase technology investment on climate innovative solutions. So we are at the forefront of climate innovation funds that are being set up in Latin America and the Caribbean now as a group, we're investing on them. So as you can see, it's not only the issue of technologies, technology and inclusion, and then to be very mindful of who their partners are and how to help them to achieve their goals, which are shared goals. Yeah, technology, innovation, I mean, this is, at the very heart of this year's International Sustainable Chemistry Conference. And uh, Melvin, what would you say are the most supporting factors in order to um, force and to um, drive the change towards financing innovation? Well, I think the, the most supporting factors would be, one main one is uh, financing, of course. For example, mm -hmm. in the, in the, as I said, in the chemical sector, trying to build a sustainable chemistry startup there are many uncertainties, right? And there are many, you, you, you need financing uh, to prove 
uh, uh, some concepts before you are in, in, uh, investment ready, before you are ready for the investor. And at that early stage, you really need financial support, which I think governments are at the best place to support startups at this place. At, the, at that stage, investors cannot come in and say, oh, here's, here, here, here's the, the money you need because they, re, they need a return on the investment and it's too early for them. So if governments can provide subsidies to support startups at that founding stage and help them uh, build the sustainable uh, chemistry innovations, that would be one of the key factors uh, to support it. Secondly is the uh, EPR, EPR schemes, or policies that support, that policies that sort of force the industries to move towards sustainability. Governments and regional governments, to be specific, for example, the EU, can really drive industries to be more sustainable. This way to force producers, or it will nudge producers to uh, invest more in innovations like uh, uh, in, in recycling or biomaterials and so forth. And that's a better drive for sustainability than, uh, than just waiting for companies themselves to decide to move to sustainability. Moving to sustainability for these companies would be costly. I mean, there are risks, uh, for example, uh, the transition risks like uh, regulations, for example. If, if companies uh, that produce these products have to switch towards a, a more uh, sustainable uh, processes, this can come with cost and limit the, the profits that they make. But if there are policies that drive the industries to move towards a certain direction, then startups can come in, create innovations, and get backup not only from uh, uh, the corporate side, but also from the government side. And the industry as a whole will move towards a more sustainable, uh, sustainable future. Absolutely. Yeah. And to stay with the regulatory framework, um, Jürgen, we are here at the fifth International Conference of Chemicals Management, organized by the EU Environment Programme and hosted by the government of Germany. So what better place to talk about policies and regulations, right? And from a capital markets perspective, um, do you think that further directives are needed in terms of sustainable finance? Well, that's a, that's a great question. <laughs> no, I think if you look at the regulation banks are, and, and the whole capital market is confronted with, then you see something like a catch-up effect. Like, until before the EU Green Deal, nothing has really happened in terms of regulation. And I think since that, since that regulation has really, really exploded. So there's so much, uh, be it the CSRD, be it EU taxonomy, or be it... CS triple triple D, which is is uh, at the horizon. So I think there's there's a lot of things that needs to be implemented by the financial services industry. From that perspective, I wouldn't ask for any additional regulation, but um, I think from a finance industry perspective, the challenge is rather a little bit how far are actually the industries we finance incentivized to change, or if incentivization. And I'm a, a big fan of incentives instead of um, limitations or, or strict rules. But we've seen it over past years that incentives purely have not been working. So I think we're very much dependent on industries to make actually their move. We're there to finance, but they also need to move. And I think in that respect, I, in some areas, I would wish more regulation for certain industries. I think that's, that's at least something that would help us. In a totally different discussion than, for example, the chemical industry, we had this discussion in Germany about a um, heating um, law that um, was discussed in the parliament over a month and then was weakened so much that it has, is it not, is go, not going to have any impact, to be really honest. On the other hand, we as banks, we're sitting on these residential mortgages and trying to push and encourage each and every retail client to do their retrofitting of houses. So it also shows a little bit the Inca li interlinkage. So banks can do a, play a significant role in financing, no doubt, and, and steering actually the funding, but it also needs some more push and towards other, the industries. Sure. And uh, to talk about incentives, Agustin, you have a, a long experience as a climate finance advisor in the uh, IFC, which I think will be quite interesting for our audience. Can you explain why there is a significant focus on climate projects in emerging countries? Uh, how were these funds mobilized? Okay, many thanks. I am speaking from my personal opinion, how uh, bearing in mind this experience in IFC, what I mean is emerging countries is a priority. As you can see, uh, they, should, they are the most, most affected. 
however, the less polluters. Let me give you an example, Honduras, or many countries in Central America. Um, why we are trying to channel in funds through that area is because at least you will be efficient, because you will, try, you will reduce emissions, you will help, you will work in the resilience of these economies, and you can have an impact with using less resources. Um, how we mo mobilize funds? Uh, the idea to mobilize funds is like any company. One is complementing what you have with others that can help you. It's the, the partnership strategy. You have to see how to collaborate with governments, in our case with governments, with uh, multinationals, with investors, in trying to put the funds where they are required and they are more efficient. And what I said, that they have the bigger impact and they are the most profitable. On the other hand, we have to approach it from the innovation point of view. Um, let me give you an example. Imagine a farmer uh, that wants to, to finance the, the, some changes through the climate is more agriculture. But most of them in these countries, they don't have a bank account. How can you apply for a loan if you don't have a bank account? Then we have to develop some innovative financial products that can help that farmer to ask for the money. In that case, we are using as a guarantee the crop. Instead of the land, we use the guarantee the, the crop. And in that way, the, the farmer will access that money. This is another approach. Another approach is also, uh, for example, the partnership that we made with uh, Amundi. No, is trying to push uh, to boost the, the green bonds in emerging markets. The idea is to look for projects. What I said before, the idea is to look for projects that have the biggest impact. But at the same time, they, we have to look for profitability of these projects, because it's the only way that it works. Um, and this is something that will, uh, investors will believe in what we are doing, and, and they, it's more likely that they will invest in those projects. And that's it. Yeah, I mean, the, the revenue aspect is uh, quite important, as you're saying, prof profitability, uh, return on investment. And um, actually, there was uh, uh, several academics that have found a strong correlation between sustainability management in companies, financial institutions, and the performance of the related assets. Fabian, why do you think it's so? Um, yeah, well, maybe, uh, first and foremost, businesses that have the long-term perspective are more able to you know give it a a, a long-term or more stable financial growth let's say it like that that that's the first point secondly you have to imagine that for the last 40 years we had the digital revolution everything was about digital business models and how to scale them due to the need of action and social pressure, but also the policy commitments to the, to the 1.5 degree path, I believe or, or I'm convinced that there will be a sustainability revolution for the next 30 years, making sustainable investments actually the most profitable investments you can think of, and therefore the, the greatest opportunity of our generation. And the funny thing is that especially the chemical industry, and we heard it from different startups uh, this morning, they are so much interconnected in every kind of other businesses and value chains that they actually play a crucial role in that whole transformation. And with, with this crucial role, they are also the main beneficiary in this whole transformation, pr transformation process. So I kind of believe that especially those companies who uh, see quite early this potential will benefit from this whole, whole uh, uh, development. And lastly, probably that the financial markets also evaluate more this non-financial perspective. They will be able to you know, uh, pay a premium for those companies, or they will pay a premium for those companies, 
who will uh, uh, focus on topics like ecological um, uh, perspectives and also so, um, social perspectives. So I truly believe that there is a l relationship actually between a good sustainability management and the financial uh, assets performance. Sure, at the end we are talking about companies that will be resilient for the future, right? Yeah. And uh, the problem that you already addressed is the, or the problem but also the solution is the interconnectedness of chemistry with everything in our daily lives. And uh, Melvin, I would be interested in your opinion. Do you think that innovation in art sciences is enough supported? Do you think that uh, uh, there is something that could be improved in your view? Yes, indeed. Uh, from my perspective uh, from Kenya, the, the, the infrastructure for uh, chem uh, startups in the chemical sector is, is non-existent. Mm. It's, it's, not, it's not low, it's just basically non-existent. When we are trying to bring our te uh, chemical technology uh, to life, there are no support systems, there are no ecosystems that we can uh, lean on and uh, have, have support to bring our, our technology to life. So from the African perspective, there's a long way to go. We need to um, encourage governments and research institutions and global partners to come in and offer support for uh, chemical startups within Africa. One, one main thing uh, that, that we notice is there's a lot of finance that comes to support climate initiatives, but there are challenges in that. One, one key challenge is how to get the funding to actually support the companies, the startups that are doing the work. Usually the, the fund comes through uh, middlemen, for example. So the fund, there's a big initiative, for example, the European Union has big goals in supporting innovations. They bring in huge amounts of money, but the funding does not reach to the startups that are actually doing the work. There's somewhere in the middle, the money gets lost. So the funding organizations, I would like to encourage them to be keen on how the, f the funding is executed. So we get this notion that uh, funding bodies say, oh, we do not have the capacity to manage these funds. We rely on local organizations to, 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 to distribute the funding. But then there's little management and the funding is not lost. And this way, it really frustrates the people who are actually trying to create these technologies and to create impact on the planet. And the second thing about ecosystems, for example, uh, the Brightlands campus is really a blueprint of how chemical technologies can be developed. They have the facilities, uh, they have um, uh, the labs, where it's basically a playground for scientists to uh, test their ideas. So you can really go in there and do multiple experiments and prove the concept. They have piloting facilities. You can, from the lab, you can move to a piece of land, the square meters, you build your pilot plant. After approving the pilot plant, you move to a demo plant. So it's, it's a structure that really gives you the, 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 the path, idea to lab scale to pilot to demo plant. That is a key uh, support system. The, the third one is, uh, let me just skip my mind a bit. Uh, five seconds. Uh, anyway, we'll, co we'll come back to it. But those are, those are the key. Those are the ecosystem, ensuring that the financing gets to people who are supposed to, to receive it. And I'll come to the third one uh, uh, later. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we, let's stay a little bit with yeah. the emerging yeah. economies yeah. because um, I think you made a really good point here. Um, Marcelo, um, the data say that emerging economies must fill a 2.5 trillion US dollar financing gap to achieve the sustainable development goals. I mean, these are huge numbers, right? And uh, because the international public sector cannot fill this gap alone, partnerships are essential to finance the 2030 agenda. Do you have any suggestion, how can we make this? I mean, can you give any examples from projects at the IDB? Maybe there could be Lighthouse examples? Sure. Um, let, let me make a caveat here, which is, again, is important. Uh, we, we focus a lot on the gap. And of course, that's a, a huge uh, concern for everybody. But we also need to understand that not every dollar invested in sustainability does the same uh, to actually fulfill that gap. So quality of investment, it's also very important. Um, electromobility, for example, we invest quite a bit on electromobility and we are moving very fast uh, away from uh, you know demand issues, from uh, trying to incentivate demand because we think that the market 
the externality is already covered by that. And we're working more and more now in supporting uh, new innovations and new technologies coming to the market. So uh, I think that we need to be cognizant when we're looking at, we're talking about gaps uh, on the quality of investment that we do and what kind of policy perspective we need to take. Uh, we've been working quite a bit on this topic and trying to fulfill that gap with uh, new instruments uh, that actually we think that are promising. Uh, of course, we are uh, very steep now on debt for nature swaps. Uh, we have more than four of those uh, operations already uh, in our books. We also work with uh, quite a bit with blended finance, uh, especially with coal, uh, you know, with coal industries and, and trying to actually substitute. Uh, we found, for example, in Chile that we've been uh, doing great steps in substitu substituting uh, coal production for more sustainable ways of producing energy. And, and last but not least, um, we are also exploring natural asset companies. Uh, we think that buying equity on companies that eventually will produce um, you know, more sustainable solutions, it's a way of improving our portfolio. So uh, we, we partner with many industries now and we also many partners that are interested, especially institutional partners, working on these kind of things. So those are the kind of things that we're trying to cover. But again, I want to I wanna double underline uh, the gap is important, but we also need to be, as international financial institutions, smart about how we go away, go, go about trying to fill, fill out that gap. Absolutely. And this is very inspiring. D did you get your thought back? Or no. Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> yeah? All right. The, go ahead. The thought, the thought was uh, business development. So in, the, in, in chemistry, the of course, brilliant scientists always creating new products and uh, new processes. But you have to understand that you have to make a business out of it. So you have to look at the market side. Is the technology, uh, is there a need for the technology in the market? So we need experts who have experience in the chemical sector to advise on uh, young companies who are developing these new technologies, young scientists, how they can make a business out of it. So business development is also key. So here in the Netherlands, we get really business training, one-on-one -on -one coaching to see if there are people out there who want to pay, if there are customers who want to give money for your product. That's a really key aspect to actually make a business out of sustainable chemistry. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's really about um, building the bridge between the scientists and, uh, and the market, and indeed, which is uh, indeed, key. Indeed, Absolutely. Indeed. Um, I would like to ask all of you to give a final to go message for our audience for today. And uh, I would like to start with you, Augustine. OK, thank you very much. Um, what I would say is not underestimate the impact. Uh, the world is going there. And one thing I said in the beginning is not only about the what, but the hows, no? to look for the hows. It means to align the business models looking to impact in the words. And another idea, important idea, is to have the, the sustainability in the DNA of the company. It's in every, in your day-to-day -day business, in your, in your business models, in your incentives, in your objectives, in your protocols. That, that will be key for, for having a big impact. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Fabian? Uh, yeah, well, as I already mentioned, sustainable investments are the, probably the greatest opportunity we have right now in, the, uh, in our generation. Um, but we should see it not just from the, let's say, transformative perspective, because probably you know better than me that we have to act now. But you should also see it from the financial perspective and see, okay, there is a massive opportunity so let's spread the word and, and uh, kind of bring the money to the right place. Thank you. Jürgen. Well, I mean, to continue with, on, mm. on what you said, I think pressure has ne never been so high on one hand. On the other hand, innovation has never been required in such a state, such an am amount as, as of today. And I think we need to look at investing or innovating in the right areas, create impact, and um, then the money flows into the right direction. I'm pretty much convinced. Absolutely. Maybe? Yeah. So first, to, uh, to investors, I'd like to say that uh, in 
in, in the chemical sector for startups, for example, the, the return for invest, investment takes a long time. It takes 10 to 15 years to commercialize um, a chemical company, a chemical startup. So investors are coming in and trying to, to invest in these companies, especially in sustainable chemistry. It's important that they keep in mind that it take a long time to bring these products to market and to commercialize. So this, there's, there's an, uh, the, a notion for VCs that uh, you need to make money in five to seven years, but for startups like this, going to new markets, creating uh, uh, impact in the, in the environment, we need more, more time and yeah, keep the, the, a long view. And yeah, 10 to 15 years, that's when you're going to get the return on investment. And the second thing for African startups and for just um, startups in general, it will get to a point uh, you... You, you reach a certain point and there's no predecessor. There's, no one has created a path. It's a, it's, a, it's a state that you need to create a new path. Uh, no one has done it before. And when you get to that point, you need to make the step and believe in yourself that you can actually uh, accomplish what you believe uh, is, 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 is important. So, yeah, you, you have to make the step even if the future is unclear, even if it's uncertain. And that, that is going to take you far. Thanks. Very powerful. <laughs> Marcelo? Let me follow up with that one because I, I, I love what uh, has been said. Uh, I know if you're a startup, you need to be very mindful of measuring impact of your uh, business model, uh, especially on the climate and sustainability issue. Uh, if you don't have that capacity, you go to your investor and ask for a partnership there to do it. If as an investor you don't have the capacity, you go to agencies and companies now that are working to develop new metrics for impact measurement. Without impact measurement in these issues, it's very difficult to advance on uh, more investment and more sustainable investment in, this, in these topics. So impact measurement and impact product and, 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 and the, the definition of data and methodologies is a must that the industry still is not catching up with. If you compare the financial analysis of investment with the climate and sustainability analysis of investment, we're still a long ways to go. So I think that that's uh, the way to go for startups, investors, and international organizations working with them. Absolutely. So thank you all. Um, now I have raised a lot of questions. I would also like to give the opportunity to the audience to ask some questions to you. Anybody who would like to know something about our guests, are the business, their relationship to sustainable finance? I think we have a mic going around somewhere. Yes. Alexis. I have a headset. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Alexis Pazzanella, director of the ISC3 Innovation Hub. Um, let, first of all, thank, thank you uh, very much for, for these uh, statements that are also very supportive of what we are doing because we are telling every of our startups in the Global Startup Service that they need to have sustainability in, in their DNA and, and to have that in every aspect of, of their business. Um, that is on the same side something I sometimes miss uh, with the larger companies, uh, with the big enterprises, in, in terms of, you're totally right that there are lo lots of opportunities and that we will create real opportunities if you consider the total cost of ownership of things. But sometimes uh, it's a bit more narrow-minded, uh, at least what I see in, in, in some uh, positions, and it's just sometimes sustainability is still perceived as a bit of a burden rather than an opportunity. And um, so we're strongly supporting startups, and I think we're we are good in doing that. But um, could you perhaps give us some indication of what could we do in terms of um, also not supporting the large uh, corporates? I'm, we're not in the position to do that. But perhaps to, to give messages in their direction that uh, this is also the way to go and uh, they shouldn't be too overtaken by, by startups, but they should be on, on the same level with, uh, with them. Jürgen, as a part of a wholesale and retail <laughs> bank, then maybe you can give your perspective? Yeah, maybe let me start with why I think that is indeed so difficult for, for big corporates to change. I think there's mm. a, a disconnection between long-term 
goals and short-term goals and incentives mostly based on short-term goals. And as, as you also described, I mean, it's, it's a long way to go if you apply new te technologies. And I think for many, many companies, it really means turning around the, operate, the operations, applying new technologies. And from a financially pers or financial perspective, this is paying off after years. They all know, all, all C-level guys, they all know that they have to move, that they have to change but it simply conflicts with their short-term goals. And I think one of the key measures, and that's something, for example, we apply, is to in embed really sustainable targets into the incentive schemes, be it long-term, be it short-term. And um, you can also actually apply something like denominators, basically multiply, uh, giving benefits or incentives or uh, malices uh, to, to the uh, sheer or the, the, the end result of bonuses. Um, based on the achievement of sustainable targets. I think that's one way to go. And the other way is definitely also education. I mean, and, and I think it's a complex topic. It's, it's sometimes conflicting um, messages in, in, in re related to uh, environmental topics or ESG overall. And I think there's also, <laughs> we really need to step up in terms of, of education and mm -hmm. understanding of, of complex issues and uh, also relations between different decisions and I think that's that's the way how I see it and the other way is, is definitely at the end regulation which I don't like but mm. that's the other way to really push it through. Fabian you're nodding. <laughs> yeah I, I absolutely agree with Jürgen uh, but I'm I'm a friend of you know coming into action and uh, when I talk to you as a person you can use your voting rights to actually give an impact. You know, when we buy equity, we don't really have an impact because that's a secondary market. We trade with, you know, equities all around and nothing happens. But you can use your, your voting rights, actually, or engagement and really come into action. Get together. There are different NGOs like Share to Action, whatever they call it, so that you can really start doing or, or taking your voice of that chair, actually, and start to give it a pressure for that big companies. Um, and our approach for that is basically, when we look at, for example, different ETFs, the managers behind it, for example, BlackRock, they use their voting rights differently than, for example, another asset manager. So I'm not saying that you're kind of a bad person if you invest in a, in a MSCI World, for example, ETF. But if you do so, please do it with an asset manager that is using the voting rights for, the, for good incentives and for long -term, uh, for a long-term perspective. Absolutely. Very good point there. I mean, there have been also some movement in the fintech area in order to enable also um, smaller pri private investors to be able to use their uh, voting rights. So, because the market demand is really increasing, especially with the younger generation saying, I'm buying this, I do have a right to do this. Yeah. So, um, this is absolutely a good point. And uh, do the others would like to comment on this? Or otherwise, we have time for another question from the audience. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, thank you very much for the very interesting um, discussion there. Um, let's get back a little bit to the subject of today, actually, and this is startup, right? Yes. And Melvin uh, described a very interesting issue. Um, you've described it in the, for the example in Kenya, but from our personal experiences, I can say that it is also very difficult, actually, to find um, grant funding in Germany, especially if you're a startup. So, um, to my opinion, it is very hard, and I would like to ask you, first of all, does this, um, uh, do you agree with the statement that it is hard to apply for grant funding with, if you're especially working in a chemical or engineering um, environment? And if so, what do you think has to change in the system? Is it the governments who have to maybe unlock more um, grant funding uh, potential? Or is it my, maybe even the private sector who has to do more? What's your opinion on that, if you have one? Yeah, so first of all, uh, what we see in our experience is it would be very beneficial for governments to create specific um, funds for specific uh, startups, doing, for startups doing specific projects like, uh, for example, 
solving very complex waste streams like PFAS or diapers or whatever, or in biomaterials. So for specific challenges, governments should develop specific funds uh, to limit the, the amount of competition or to force the industry to incentivize the industry to move towards a certain direction uh, regarding sustainability. So a government can really specify a certain funding, a certain pot of money for specific projects. And start, uh, startups that are in that field really have direct access to that fund. So it uh, reduces competition, so it means you have more chances of actually accessing the funds, and it encourages other players to contribute to, to initiatives like that. And secondly, I'd like uh, I'd say is uh, startups can develop new business models uh, that are interesting to attract either investment or funds that's, that are specific for business plans. For example, we applied for a specific, specific fund when we were really early, and the, the proposal for us was not a technical proposal. The proposal we were supposed to show the business case for our company. Right. So if you, you, if, you're, if you don't have the, the right uh, technical work done, if you don't have the, the, the engineering studies, if you don't have the data from the chemistry, you can show the business, the potential of the business. So this really makes it much easier for a startup to apply for funding because they can really show the potential of the business five or seven years from now, how much money is going to get, the revenue, ROI for customers, and so forth. And this is a different shift compared to uh, uh, technical applications, we, which really require, uh, require um, uh, heavy scientific data, which most startups do not have. But if you have a business plan and funds and, the, and, and subsidy providers can fund you based on your business plan, that's a much easier, it's not very, it's not very easy, but it's a much, uh, it's, it's a better chance of you getting the funding than, the, than funding opportunities that rely on technical data. So it's a, it's, yeah, it's, you, you need, we need to, uh, uh, to sort of educate and, and, and propose to funding bodies and say, okay, we don't have the technical data, we need funding for that technical data, but we have a business plan that is quite, uh, has a lot of potential, and you can use that business plan um, and the projections that to provide funding. And I think that's, uh, we, we have proven that in, in, the, uh, in, in where we work in, in the south of the Netherlands. That is one approach that they, they use to support startups that are, that are really early. Yeah. And Thank you very much. I, I want to add something that everyone is aware. Uh, this, uh, we are using every time a more complex language between one another. <laughs> what I mean is, if you check the taxonomy in the EU, EU and you check the taxonomy in Colombia or in other countries, uh, you see they have to, to change, to, to, to adjust the, the, this taxonomy. But if you try to put that taxonomy into, a, into funds or into a financial product, you will see how complex it is to make it easy. To make, to make, uh, for example, we are not only speaking about the taxonomy, we are speaking about the scope one, scope two, even scope four. Um, what I mean is there is a challenge. There has been also, uh, we have been testing in the ta EU taxonomy the application in the financial products in different sectors. And what I saw is there is still a long way to, a long road, a long way to go just to be there. Uh, and what, it, what you cannot understand well, you cannot sell well, and you cannot buy either. You know what I mean? It's, and if we speak about the chemistry sector, you, you can imagine what I'm saying. Yeah, thank you for your contributions. I'm okay. afraid our time is up, but I'm looking forward to continuing the discussions with you this evening in the networking event. And uh, thank you for your participation. It has been very insightful, and thank you for the audience for being here and for your good questions. Yeah, thank you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie.